stuff coming up, you know, and we have a prayer request thing on our website now. People are starting to respond to that, and, and uh, you guys can do that too, really, if you have any prayer requests. Uh, don't be shy. We'll pray for you. We won't put it on the internet or anything like that, but we want, we, if you have prayer requests, you can email us, and we'll get it, pray here Wednesday night specifically for that need, and plus the rest of the week, everybody that's in the prayer team will carry that with them and stuff like that. So we want to start doing that, taking these prayer requests and, and photocopying them and giving them to everybody who comes to the prayer meeting. And we don't have to, you know, broadcast it or anything. We just got to be faithful. And so praise the Lord. So tonight, I want to, I got to get going here. And um, yesterday when I was driving home, I, I was thinking, Lord, what do you want me to preach on tomorrow night? Because I didn't, can think of nothing. Empty. Empty-headed, as usual. And, um, and I didn't know what to think on. And he just, he, he told me this. He said, trouble, trouble, trouble. Yeah. Trouble, trouble, trouble. And you got her. Yeah. And, and so, so um, I thought there's only one place I could go to in scriptures that I could think of right away. And, and so I was going to preach on something else. Uh, I was thinking about that way, but I, I kind of figured I better listen to what Jesus had to say. And, and so I'm going to start in John chapter 16. And I'm going to go back into 14, 15 and set it all up and why I'm going to talk about this and, and, and just so that we as a people can understand the ways of God. Uh, we sometimes, we, we, we try to figure out things from a human perspective on what God is doing. But when you take the word and really look at it and see what kind of church he really wants, and that's what I'm going to get to today, the type of church that he really wants, how that church functions and what it operates and what it looks like a little. I'm going to do that today because there's a lot to it. There's a lot to it. So I'm just going to kind of open up some stuff here tonight. You might not like me by the end of the night, but that's okay. You'll forgive me, I'm sure. And... Um, and if you don't agree with me, it's okay. It's not a problem. I don't have a problem with that. I don't worry about who agrees with me and who doesn't agree with me. That doesn't matter to me one bit. Um, but uh, I don't sit up and think about, I hope everybody agrees with me. I don't even think about it. I don't care. I do care, but I don't. You know what I'm saying? I don't, I don't worry about like what a lot of people worry about. Oh, I shouldn't have said that. People get up and preach. Oh, I shouldn't have said that. Maybe I shouldn't have said that. I don't think like that. I just give up on that a long time ago. So now I just preach. And uh, preach the word of God. So I'm going to do that. John chapter 16. We're going to go. I'm going to read the whole chapter 33. Uh, 1 to 30, uh, chapter 16, 1 to 33. 33 verses. And uh, then we're going to go into that. We're going to have fun tonight. I believe. I'm excited. The word of God is, it can change your life tonight. Amen. 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 I'm just so, so, I'm so excited about that because... It doesn't matter, whenever you walk into a building, all of a sudden, everything can change for you. Your life can change forever. And you can walk in and think, there's, it's absolutely hopeless. There's nothing that anybody can do for me. But then all of a sudden, Jesus shows up. And he is just not anybody. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> he is just not anybody. He, he comes. And he's got solutions. And he's got, he's got life. Amen. I love serving Jesus because he's given me life. I have life. Today, Pastor West was visiting in my office, and I just couldn't shut up. Could I? Uh, I just couldn't shut up. And, and that's just the way it is when you're full of the Spirit of God because there's just so much to life. You know, everybody's so worried. And so, so worried about the times we live in and all that stuff. I think it's the most exciting time to be alive. Absolutely, without a shadow of a doubt. Never before have I been in a situation like this. No matter where you go, no matter what you do, no matter who you talk to, there's people that are waiting for a great anticipation that revival is here. You know, they're, they're, they're not only waiting, they're actually doing something to, uh, to ignite revival. And so never was it like this before. Three years ago, you didn't hear about that. People just, it was only here. But now it's everywhere. So it's so good. It's so good. So John chapter 16. Let's pray. The pray the prayer that we're, we always pray. And, um, and let's do it. Dear Lord Jesus, <laughs> speak to my heart. 
and change my life in your precious name. Amen. <laughs> it's just, I don't know, God's telling me something. Something came in to my head right at that moment when I wanted to pray. So anyway, <laughs> John, whoo, 16. All this I've told you so that you will not go astray. Wow. He's telling all this, that, you know, and he's talking about 14 or 13, 14, 15, all that stuff. He's talking about all that. He says, and if he says, there's a, you know, I'm doing this so you don't go astray, there's a, probably means that there's a great possibility that you'll go astray. And so they will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think he's offering a service to God. Um, so this is the, he's training his people how he wants to build a church, really. He's really setting it all up because this is the kind of church that I want, Jesus is saying. He says, they will do such things because they do not know the Father or me. I have told you this so that when the time comes you will remember that I warned you. I did not tell you this at first because I was with you. Now I'm going to him who sent me, yet none of you asked me, where are you going? Because I said these things, you are filled with grief. But I tell you the truth, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment, in regard to sin because men do not believe in me, in regard to righteousness because I'm going to the Father where you can see me no longer, and in regards to judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. And he's talking about Satan there. I have much to say to you more than you can bear, but when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He, not, he will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. He will tell you what, I, uh, what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by take, taking from what is mine and making it known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. In a little while, you will see me no more. And then after a little while, you will see me. And some of his disciples said to one another, What? Does he mean saying, in a little while you will see me no more, and then, after a little while, you will see me, and because I'm going to the Father. They kept asking, what does he mean by a little while? <laughs> We're still talking that same way. What does he mean by all this little while, this time, very soon, all that stuff? Um, we don't understand what he's saying. Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about this, so he said to them, are you asking one another about what I meant when I said? In a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me. I tell you the truth, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will be turned to joy. A woman given birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because her joy, or her joy that a child has been born into the world. So with you now, your time is of grief, but you will see again and you will rejoice and no one will take away your joy. It's worth connecting to Jesus just for that reason right there. In that day, you will no longer ask me anything. I will tell you the truth. My Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. Though I have been speaking figuratively, a time is coming when I will no longer use this kind of language, but will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day, you will ask in my name, and I, and I am not saying that I will ask the Father on your behalf. No, the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and entered the world. Now I am leaving the world and going back to the Father. Then Jesus' disciples said, Now you are speaking clearly and without figures of speech. Now we can see that you know all things and that you do not even need to have asked anyone to ask you questions. This makes us believe that you came from God. Your belief 
You believe at last, Jesus answered. <laughs> this is like three and a half years. But a time is coming and has come when you will be scattered each to his own home. You will leave me all alone. Yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So, in this world, you're going to have trouble. Right? People think they're going to come to church and they won't have trouble anymore. No, you'll have trouble. In church, you'll have trouble. In your home, you'll have trouble. There's lots of people, they leave churches because they have trouble. Because of trouble going on in the church, they leave. They, they leave. People leave relationships because of trouble. Trouble, trouble, trouble. People say, they think, oh, I must be a horrible person. I have so much trouble. No, that's about right. You have trouble. Because in this world, you will have trouble. The problem, our problem, is that most people run from the one who can help them in the time of trouble. That's the problem. The trouble's not the problem. The problem is we run from the one that can help us through the trouble. And that's Jesus. And we run from the people that can help us, and that's the people of God. And that's, that's, where the, that's when trouble becomes trouble. <laughs> and, you know, and we run from Jesus, and if you're not with Jesus, trouble is not fun. Trouble without Jesus can wipe you out. Trouble with Jesus is normal, and it's rather invigorating at times. Right? If your focus is right, if you're understanding what is going on, the dynamic that's going on all around you, all the stuff that's going on in you, trouble all of a sudden can be invigorating. I remember when I had that kidney stone attack, and it was such an awesome pain. It made me throw up. It hurt so bad. And Josh, I remember you come in, Josh and Daryl and... Who else was there? Jordan, the three amigos, the three McDonald's. They come and see me in the morning. And I remember looking, Josh, are you okay? I said, oh, it was awesome. And he looked at me, and, he, and then we all just burst out laughing. I think I was still stoned on morphine at the time. But, but anyway, they, they gave me this stuff, and ah, you know, I was out. in the fact of the matter, I'd been fasting for 11 days. And so I had no food in me, so that morphine really hung on for a long time. And, uh, and so, but, but we talk like that. We talk like that. We go through, we talk like that now. When we go through a rough day or a trial or troubles or whatever, instead of looking at one another and say, oh, what was me? We say, oh, it was awesome. You know, I, and Josh is working out in, uh, out at uh, the seed plant there. In the spring, and they're up to their knees, Josh and Jordan and Mud and on uh, and the crew, they're all working out there. Up, and Josh says, it's, it's awesome. It's an epic battle. <laughs> he says, I think there's lightning out there. You're hitting the ground as we're working. And so when you think like that, everything just becomes different. What do you think? You think we, because we live in a world that's full of trouble. Full of trouble. Trouble, 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 trouble. And if you don't, if you're not connected to the one that you can, that can help you, it's overwhelming. But if, if you're connected to the one, it becomes invigorating in lots of ways. And uh, so you probably think I'm crazy by now, but that's okay. Phil Collins asked the, asked the question. Phil Collins was the speaker, not the singer. He's the preacher. But he, he's from Britain anyway. He's a, he's a Brit. He asked a question at the refresh conference kind of thing we were at. It was really good. And he asked this question. He said, what's the toughest question that you are faced with as a pastor? What's the toughest question you have for God? And, and so I thought about that, and, and I, I knew right away what out my question is. But a lot of people, what's your, tough, what's your question to God? What's the toughest thing that you can think of right now? Just think it and hold it, hold it to yourself. And so a lot of people, they think, you know, uh, uh, 
like pastors, they'll think this way. Um, so how could I get people to come to church? You know, how, how can I get people to come to church? How can I get people to get committed? And, you know, I was thinking of all the pastors there, what they were thinking. What, you never ask anybody what we're thinking. And, and, and one of the, probably one of the questions, how can I please everybody? All kinds of stuff like that. And there's all these questions. You know, you think about your toughest question that you have for God right now, that you're not getting an answer for. My toughest, the question that I've had for the last two years is, how do I get God to come to church? How do I get God to come to church? It's, and so, because, you know, because the, there's trouble all the time. I, I figure if God shows up, my job's going to get a whole lot easier. So instead of me thinking about, oh, what kind of outreaches could I have to get people to come to this church? What kind of stuff can we do to get people to come to this church? What kind of gimmick can we set out? I start thinking two years ago, and it was after the Lord spoke to me, and he told me, it was about two and a half years ago, and he said, there's only one thing missing here in your church, Terry, and that's me. Okay, so I said, okay, um, how do I get him to show up? And, and so that's the question that I've been asked. And, and then, once he comes, how do we get him to stay? And so, that, you know, think about it. If, if God shows up, church will, be, church will be pretty good. Yeah, right? You know, it'll, it'll be awesome because he'll show up and he'll heal people, set them free, and deliver them. And then all I got to do is shake their hand and love them. Right? <laughs> teach them some stuff. How do you stand now? This is how you stand. We've learned how to stand. We learn how to fight. So we can teach them how to fight, how to stand. We equip them to go out to there, do the work, and, and go he bring healing and deliverance and healing, raising the dead and all that stuff. And so there, I thought, oh, yeah, that's be pretty good. As a pastor, we would never burn out then, would we? Why do pastors burn out? There's, and one of the reasons why pastors burn out is they're trying to please everybody. They're going to please. I got to just learn how to please everybody. You ain't going to do it. You can't do it. Jesus himself could not do it. So how do you expect a mere human mortal pastor to do it? You're right. You know, please everybody. He, he didn't please everybody. He, lots of times, he even said, I didn't come to bring peace. I come to bring a sword. You know, and so uh, all that stuff. And so how do I get God to show up? And, um, and how do I get teach people or how do we get people into the presence of God by myself it's easy to get it's no problem to get into the presence of God it's it's easy very easy but a lot of people don't know how but we are the body of Christ and Christ functions at his maximum potential through his body right and that's it it's not he 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 doesn't function the greatest through individualistic superstars his body is where he functions at his maximum potential. And that's, the, and that's the people of God. That's the people of God. From his body, God's name is honored and restored, right? His, his name upon the earth. And our whole perspective of church is wrong. Our perspective is, is completely wrong. We want to have a church where people come in and have fuzzy feelings, all that kind of stuff. People come and testify about how great they are and stuff like that. You know, we want to hear stuff like that. We want to hear those stories. But I like when Stephanie come up here the other day and testify, I want to be free. <laughs> yeah, that was, that's really what church is all about. And so the, she comes up here and she says, I want to be free. I want to be free from this and I'm going to be free from it tonight by talking in front of you about what's bothering me and what the problem is. And so that's how you get free. And so that's a different kind of church. And church is going to get messy when God shows up prodigals return and so that when the prodigals return they're working out problems and things are happening and god shows up it starts stirring stuff up it, uh, when god shows up and this doesn't mean that everybody's going to be healthy and and whole in about the next 12 seconds as he continues to show up he begins to manifest himself and things start to come out of us that need to get dealt with and it it's been coming out of me lots in the last few months because there's been lots of trouble. And it's been good. A prodigal friendly church is a tough thing to be a part of. 
prodigal friendly churches are very difficult to pastor because people want to get better people want to get well if if you just pastor a church that people show up on sunday morning and don't care about god or anything in the rest of the week it's very easy to pastor a church like that but when people start coming and say I want to get right with God. I want to get filled with the Holy Spirit. I want to get, it really gets messy, it gets ugly. You get people showing up at church that you never dreamt that ever would come through the door. Right? (laughs) What are they doing here? Well, they happen to be the sinners that want to get saved or set free or delivered. The people that Jesus came for. He didn't come for the good. He didn't come for the righteous. So if a church is functioning, if God is showing up in church, the unrighteous people or the sinners should start walking into the doors. Not about, oh, we're so good here. No, we're not. We're not. I wish I could say we're all just a bunch of goody tissues here, but we ain't. We got issues. And God is working on every one of us, and he's working on me on the forefront more than, more than I think, more than anybody here. Some of you may argue but I got to come up here and, and shoot my mouth off every, every week and tell you about principles of God that work. So he challenges me and all this stuff. It's unbelievable. So this prodigal friendly church is a tough place to be a part. We're going to, it's going to be right up here. It's going to say, it's going to say, Sinaboy Apostolic Church, a whole, place of hope, healing, and restoration. And there's a flame and a cross and all that stuff. It's going to be on right on here. And so when you become, that means we're prodigal friendly. We want the most messed up people in all creation to come here. Are you ready for that? Are you ready for that? Are you ready to help somebody try to get their lives straightened up that's an odd mess? Like, I mean, a real mess? Are you ready for that? Or you just want to have potlucks and talk about how good each other is? You know, really, are we ready for that? It gets messy, friends. Messed up people coming to church to get healed, to get set free, to get delivered. Now saying that, it's a real beneficial for God to show up in church. (laughs) Because what are we going to do with them? (laughs) <laughs> really what are we going to do with them so we better be full of God people we better be full of God so when people walk into these doors they better, they better feel welcome they better feel we better not look down at anybody down our noses at anybody who walks through these doors whatever sexual preference they have whatever we want them to know Jesus and Jesus can make people better make them well right amen so, um, is not a novel idea, though, God coming to church. How about if we all wake up in the morning and say, Jesus, please show up in church today. You know, come and prepare. We, we were, I'm sorry, guys, but we weren't prepared when we come to church today. Everybody was like, kind of like, you know, this is a la-la land. I don't know what it was. We're praying downstairs. It seemed like, a, I don't know what. It was a silent prayer type thing. You know, it was kind of, I'm not criticized. I'm just saying this, this wasn't our normal. But we broke through. We come and worshiped and we busted through. All that stuff is good. But we have to be ready. When we walk in to these doors, when we come to church, we need to be ready to worship the king. Amen? doesn't matter how we feel, what we look like. You know, don't worry about that stuff. Just come in here. I'm going to meet with the king today. I'm going to worship God. I'm going to honor his name. I'm going to bring glory to his name. And, and, and we can actually have God come to church, and I'm going to show you how here in a few seconds. And um, so what is the church? Is this, is this the building the church? No, it's not. This is just the place we meet. This is just the place we've been blessed with where we can meet, we can come together. It's comfortable you know, it's it's an awesome place to go and, and to be here. This is just very nice and nice padded chairs and all that. But that's not the church. You're the church. We're we're the church. And so God really wants us to have a kingdom culture, develop a kingdom culture that anything can happen at any time. 
So we walk outside these doors, whether we're with somebody or whether we're not, something can happen for the kingdom. Something can happen for God in a sick, in the twinkling of an eye. Just, just because we're, we have a king, we've, we've created a kingdom culture. I, um, uh, what's his name now? Um, the pastor that was here a couple weeks ago in Quebec. Bruce, see, it's Freeze, see, Freeze, whenever I'm up here, Bruce, Bruce Lundgren. He says, I love what's going on here. And I said, I said, what? I said we just got an awesome group of people. And he says, you guys have created a culture here where God is showing up. I like that. I liked when he said that, and I thought, awesome, but we've got a long ways to go. Um, so a kingdom culture that anything can happen at any time. So in John chapter 16, verse 33, he says, I've told you these things so that... Um, in me, you may have peace. In this world, you'll have trouble, but take heart. I've overcome the world. And so we want, a God, we want a church with God, where God shows up. And we want, we want to, and, and so when you read these scriptures, you guys always remember in context, 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 context. It was just, he just didn't preach John chapter 16 and then stop preaching. And, and he started way before this. And in chapter 14, here he's, he starts doing this awesome teaching. He starts to comfort the disciples. And through this all, we're going to learn how to get God to come to church and how to get God in your homes. Would you like to have Jesus show up at your home? Right? If he can show up here, he can surely show up in our homes. Right? And so in John chapter 14, he's... Con he's so these are some of the things that you got to do these are some of the things you got to do in order for God to show up. And so um, here's Jesus. He starts comforting his disciples. And so we're going to have a real comforting message from Jesus. Just watch as we, we get into this. <laughs> I love this. I love the way he preached. He don't preach like most of us, you know, evangelicals. Us evangel we don't preach like this. Because this is wild. What he's, and I'm, I'm saying this is, this is unreal what he's preaching. He says this, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. So we have to trust, right? In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. And so he's got this place. Remember, you know, they always, they start playing on the piano and soft music. In my father's house are many rooms, if it were not true, you know. And we start building it up. And God's got this beautiful place for you. And all you have to do is say this sinner's prayer and everything's going to be okay. And then you're going to have a room rented there and are paid for, all that stuff. But he, he Ah, he goes so much deeper than this. And so after this, he starts, he taught, in my father's house are many places. So he's getting us heavenly minded right away. But then he goes on further in the chapter and he starts talking about things like, hey, you're going to do greater things than I do. Those that believe. You're going to do greater things than I do here on the earth after I leave. Can you believe that? He will do greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. And so here we are, doing greater things, and he promises to send his Holy Spirit to uh, obedient people. So, uh, being obedient is, is somebody that will actually do what he tells you to do. So he's going to send his Holy Spirit to obedient people, and then he says he's going to show up. Here. Here. John chapter 14, verse 15. It says this. If you love me, you will obey what I command. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. The Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you will know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. So that means that God can show up. Right? Right? God can show up. God can live with you. And he can do it in your house. He can do it in your church. He can do it where? He says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will see me 
will not see me anymore, but, I, but you will see me because I live, you will also live. On that day you will realize that I am in my Father and you are in me and I am in you. God can show up. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father and I too will love him and show myself to him. Judas, verse 22, and Judas not... Judas Iscariot said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Verse 23, Jesus replied, If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and he will come to him and, and make our home with him. And so, he's, this is good news. It truly is good news. Verse 21 said, I too will love him and show myself to him. Now, Verse 25 and 26 says this, All this I have spoken while there's well still with you, but the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. And so here is really good news. The Holy Spirit shows up He's working with us. And now, now, surely to goodness, we're obeying God. Surely to goodness, and now we're going to start bearing fruit. Surely to goodness, now we'll have warm, fuzzy feelings. We will have no more trouble. Everything is just going to smoothly, it's just going to smooth, come along. And, and he's given us the Holy Spirit. He's given us the ability to learn all things. That's why I don't watch... I don't watch Christian television for 12 hours or 14 hours a day because I want to get the revelation from God because he said he'll come to us and teach us, right? So I want to, I want to be taught by him. So I, I, nothing, I got nothing against that, but personally I want to get the revelation myself, right? And so now everything is going really good. We're cruising along. We're obeying Jesus. We're doing everything he tells us to. And now everything's going to go good, going to go right. It's going to get good, right? Right? right. Wrong. It will go right God's way, but not the North American cultural way. Okay? John 15, verse 1 to 8. You're going to hate this. You're going to hate this now. You've got to understand something here. He said, I am the true vine. My father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, <laughs> so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given to you. For this to my Father's glory, that th this is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourself to be my disciples. <laughs> wow. So now we're obeying God. We're doing everything he tells us to do. We're bearing fruit. He starts to prune us. It's kind of a picture of what's been going on in the church here. <laughs> we're all just getting rattled. He's pruning. Ah, that hurt. <laughs> you know, over. I thought we we're going to have the, when are we going to get the warm and fuzzy feelings? All that stuff. We get that once in a while. There's times that happens and he refreshes and all that. But for the most part, it doesn't happen. We're waiting, we're waiting, we're waiting, we're waiting. And so here we go, you know. Verse 11 in that same chapter. I was on 15, right? And he says, I have... So here he goes on to say, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. May be complete. I've told you this. I've told you that I'm going to get the, the pruning shears. Trim me up. Produce, fr produce fruit. Once you start producing fruit, I'm going to prune you some more. 
See, do you understand what's been going on here the last couple of years? We start bearing some fruit, and then the shears come out. Come on, where's the warm, fuzzy stuff? I want that. It, so, this is quite fascinating to me when you look at these scriptures. And so now we're bearing fruit, we're pruned, we're starting to love one another. And verse 11, it said that. And now what was the next one? It was 16 and 17. It says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Right? Verse 17 says this. This is my command that you love each other. So we're bearing fruit. We're getting pruned. We're loving one another. All that's... And now no more trouble? Right? No more trouble? Trouble? No more trouble? Let's check. Verse 18. It says this now. You're doing everything he tells you to do. You're bearing fruit. You're being pruned. You're loving one another. Now it's going to be peaceful. We're going to go, yeah, we're going to go to church every Sunday and Thursday. This is going to be warm, fuzzy feelings. And then he goes on to say, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. I love how he preaches. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. <laughs> as it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember the words I spoke to you. No servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will also obey yours also. Right? And so, where am I here? Oh, I got to go all the way to 27. They will treat you this way because of my name. For they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. Now listen to this carefully here. Right here. He says, if I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. Now, however, they have no excuse for their sin because he who hates me hates my father as well. If I had not done among them what no one else did, they would be guilty of sin. But now they have seen the miracles and yet they have hated both me and my father. But this is to fulfill what is written in the law. They hated me without reason. When the counselor comes, whom I will send you, send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me, and you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. And so here we, Jesus, why did you have to say that? We were, we were bearing fruit, we were loving one another, we're getting pruned, we're getting clipped up, and everything we got, everything we're doing, everything you tell us to do, and then you're going to tell us the world hates you? You see, you got to remember when you read these things, in, in con you have to read it in context so you understand what's going on here. You, chapter 16 isn't the beginning of the message. I started there just to, so I could build a good message, but... Make it sound so easy. Oh, it's going to be trouble. We're going to have trouble. But why are you going to have trouble? You're going to have trouble because you're doing kingdom activity. You're doing things the king wants you to do. You're obeying God. You're listening to the word of God. You're doing what he tells you to do. You're loving one another. You're being pruned and you're not complaining. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, Bernie? Yeah, pruning and not complaining. Yeah. It's, uh, that's why now we're learning how to say it's awesome when we're going through stuff. Because we don't want to disappoint Jesus, you know, and be complaining and stuff like that. And so now when you look at chapter 16, verse 1, he says, this, all this I have told you so that you will not go astray. You're going to have trouble. Verse 33, it says, 1633, it says, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In the world you'll have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Think of this all now. 
And yet people choose themselves. They say, I don't want Jesus. I'm just going to go with the trouble. I'm just going to have trouble. I know I'm going to have trouble, but I'm going to do it without him. But with him, you can have peace through trouble. Without him, you don't have peace. The opposite takes place. You have turmoil going on in your And then you're trying to figure out how to get all of this trouble. And Jesus is wanting to help you, but you won't let you. You won't let him. And so, so this is what church, how do we get God to show up? Do what he tells, obey him, believe what he says. And then the spirit of God, this is why revivals always stop. Because things start moving, God starts moving, God brings out the shears, starts crooning, cleaning up, cl- getting everybody all ready to do the work of the Lord, and then everybody runs away because it got too hard. The world started hating them. Oh, you mean the world's hating us? Aren't, isn't the church, aren't they supposed to be loving us? Not according to Jesus. They hated him without reason. They hate, I can see why they hate us lots of times, but they hated him without reason. <laughs> really? I can see why. I've been, I, I haven't been hated for the right reason. I haven't hated because I've been stupid. But, but he was hated without reason. And so we have the opportunity to have trouble with contentment. And peace. Wake up in the morning. Yeah, there's trouble all around us. There's trouble in our houses. There's trouble with our neighbors. There's trouble in our families and all that stuff. But you can still have peace through it all. Because you're connected with the one who can help you. I love it. This this is a good word. Like John 14, 15, 16. Go on into 17 and all that. You know, I can't go that much further with that right now. Because we're running out of time. But... Really, just, and so you look at the model church that he's talking about here. It's going through persecution. You're being pruned. You're obeying everything. You're doing everything that you're told, and you're going nothing, having nothing but trouble. And go and praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. You see, now, what does the world see when they see us? They, they usually see bickering and complaining and one of the but at least if you're going to get in if you're going to have people complaining about you the world complaining about you let them complain because we're doing what we're told by Jesus not because we're bickering and over doctrines and all that stuff most doctrines are created just out of failure anyway God didn't show up or work so they created a doctrine why he didn't show up to make excuses so we don't have to seek God anymore. Let's just lay on the floor and cry till he comes back. Let's just be a bunch of whining complainers and just lay on the floor and kick and cry till he comes back and talk about how bad it is in the world. It's the world's fault. No, it's not. We're to be the light of the world. He left us in charge. He left us in charge to, to, to clean up this mess down here, to point them to him, Right? We're blaming, we're blaming all the bad people for all the tsunamis and the earthquakes and all the stuff that's going on, but it's, it's the church, my friends. The earth is groaning and cr- crying out, cr- just groaning and waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God to appear, to show up. Oh, and it's so awesome. It's so awesome. Now, you know, when you can walk around without having fear, Hey, if the world ends tomorrow, we're okay. But, but we got work to do. I don't want the world to end on, on the 21st. I got a lot of people that I love that don't, don't know Jesus yet. And, you know, I, I, I got a, there's this whole town full of people. I haven't met anybody I really don't like here yet in this town. You know, they may not like me, but that doesn't make no sense. Why can't I like them? Yeah, right? And so I got a lot of people just in this town that I I've, I've really appreciate and like and a lot of neighbors that don't know Jesus. And, and so if we can learn how to connect with God, this is the kind of church, is this the kind of church we want? We want a prodigal church, prodigal friendly church? Are you sure you want God to show up at church? You know why most people don't want God to show up? Because these things start happening. 
These things start happening. The pruning starts taking place. The persecution starts taking place. And, and nobody's ready for it. They don't understand the will of God. They don't understand that. The, he talks about everything that's going to happen to you along the way. He's going to talk about the, the struggles. He talks about the prodigals leaving. You know, and they're leaving. He doesn't want them to leave, but he le lets them go. He doesn't chase after them until they're ready to come back. And they come back, he runs to them. You know, I, I, I wish I would have never been a prodigal. I love being with Jesus. I love this life. I love the kingdom culture. I love that there's always hope. I love the fact that there's always hope. Amen. You know, when I watch the news, I go, oh, gee, this is perfect. Perfect, perfect atmosphere for revival. Godlessness, evil, darkness. Where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. I, I love it. People say, oh, if only prayer would come back into schools, we'd have her made. No, it's like if only Jesus would come back into schools, we'd have her made. If Jesus would come back into the people, the, the people of God, then the schools would have a chance. <laughs> right? And so then we'd have a chance at, at doing something for the kingdom of God. God is good. All the time he's good. In this world, you're going to have trouble. How do you handle that trouble? How do you, how do you, do you get worse or do you get better through it? I've had my moments, <laughs> I tell you. But I can handle a lot more trouble than I could a few years ago. Because I didn't understand it all. I don't, oh, if, if all this, if we got off, all this stuff is, if everything you do, and I'm going to talk about Gideon on Sunday and he kind of said that. He said, if all this is so good, why, why is this stuff happening to us? You know, I used to be like that. And I'm wondering, well, how come there's no revival? How come there's no this? How come there's no that? You know, I'm always, how come, how come, how come? And then a few weeks ago, remember I preached that message that said, do you trust God enough never to ask why again? He's getting his people set up for that right now. You see, the disciples, the ones that were killed... You know, those disciples, those ones that were hung on the cross, those disciples that Peter, remember Peter was crucified upside down because he didn't feel himself worthy to be crucified. They never asked why. They never complained. They just did what they were told to do. The other church was dynamic. It grew. Nobody joined them really carelessly. Nobody joined them carelessly, like the early church, and there was things happening there. Ananias, remember Ananias and Sapphira, they got killed when they lied at church? Bang, dead. Nobody, everybody highly esteemed the, the, the believers after that. Everybody highly esteemed those believers, and, and, and nobody dared join them. They didn't take it lightly. They highly respected the people of God, but we just aren't ready to join you yet. <laughs> And, and, and so we want a church. I want to, I, you know, I really believe that we're going to have a church that's going to be like special forces. We're going to go in to places where nobody dares go, and we're going to go in there, we're going to rescue the helpless, the hurting people in the name of Jesus. We're going to go in Jesus. We're probably never going to have a mega church. I'll probably never pastor a mega church, because, but I wouldn't mind having 10,000 people that were serious for God. That would be awesome. You imagine what you could do with 10,000 sold out people for Jesus? That would be good, right? <laughs> the services would end and everybody, okay, gone, out the door and rescue on rescue missions. All over the place. Imagine going into the inner city and just going into the deepest, darkest places. I've done that. That's fun. It's fun. It's one time I remember this lady giving me this name of this guy, and I didn't know what I was getting into. He said, this guy was really beat up. He really wants to talk to somebody. So I went to his hotel or his apartment, and it was like a rough place. This was rough. And, um, and, and I didn't know there, but the devil was there <laughs> with him um, in the form of a person. And, um, and so we, we went there, and, and this guy wanted some help. He he really did, but the devil wouldn't let me talk to him. So the devil come out and he started pushing me around in the hallway. And I thought, 
oh, this is good. I've never had this happen before. I wonder what's going to happen. You know, I didn't really know what was going to happen. I had maybe a little bit of fear for a few minutes. And then he, he went up to push me again. And then he stopped. He goes, okay, I'm not going to mess with you no more. I said, okay, good. Can I talk to him now? Because <laughs> really, I wasn't looking forward to beating. You know, I, I thought my fist was clenching. I wonder why that's happening. <laughs> Supposed to be a man of God. But backslidden. But anyway, it wasn't because of that. He's seen something. Somebody showed up. One of my one of my secret service agents showed up from behind me. And he stopped. I thought, I like this. And so I talked to this guy and and uh, he was pretty much out of it. And he was really strange, you know, it was really strange. And then we were, like, we were out somewhere in the inner city and, and went to church the next, I said, be in church tomorrow night. If you really are serious about changing your life, be in church tomorrow night. And lo and behold, this guy, that he didn't bring the devil with him this time, but this time he walked, he came to church and I looked at him, I said, praise the Lord, brother. He says, it's just a coincidence I'm here. <laughs> I liked it. It was good. I laughed right in his face. I said, that's good. But trouble. Ever since we got to be believers, we've had trouble. And that's what I kind of like about it. I can't imagine being in some boring religion that nobody ever persecutes you or fights with you, wants to kill you, or all that stuff like that. I just can't believe that, that I wouldn't want to be in something like that. I want something where there's action. We're gonna, we want to we wanna help the the hurting and the dying and the lost people, but you're going to have the battle of a lifetime in the meantime. Amen? So, are you looking forward to waking up tomorrow to trouble? Aren't you glad you have me as a pastor? I mess with your minds. You know, really, like, think about this. It's all about attitude. You wake up tomorrow, I bet you won't have no anxiety if you're not worried about have, not having trouble because it's just a part, normal part of this world. There'll be a time when this will stop. The millennial rule of Jesus and all that stuff, it'll be the way things ought to be. Really. All that stuff. And so I don't know how it's all going to work. or I don't really, it's not up to me. I, I just want to follow Jesus. So when I know when all this stuff begins to happen, I just want to be close to Jesus. You know, all the end times fear that's going on out there, and people are just scared to death. How am I going to, oh, what if we can't buy food and we don't have the mark and all that, all that stuff? And, and, and you don't have to worry about that because Bernie said he will volunteer to get the mark and then he'll buy us food. <laughs> 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 nah, you don't worry about silly stuff like that see when I hear this stuff the weirdest things go through my head but then I, I think of the supernatural miraculous provision of God we're not tied to an economic system of the world we don't have to worry about any of that stuff. We don't have to worry about buying a semi-load of dried food so that we can endure the tribulation or any of that. We don't have to worry about that. Worry, worry, worry. Spend all our money, you know? People have, that guy, that one guy spent 140000 announcing to the world that the world's going to end on May, May 21st. 140,000 bucks. I wish he would have talked to me first. I would have got him to donate it to the church. I said, I'll promise to put it on the air after the 21st. You know, or I'll put it on in the morning, the 21st. But when's it supposed to happen? At midnight? No, okay. <laughs> you know, 140,000 bucks. Really? Worried about trouble. And he doesn't even know who's going to make it. He didn't even know if he was going to make it. I don't know. He says, you can't know for sure. I say, read this Bible. You can know for sure. Right? Okay. So let's stand.